Okay, hi everybody. Welcome back to another podcast here for Tan Books. I'm Paul Kengor and Steve Cunningham is the producer. We have a fellow Tan Books author here, Carrie Gress, somebody that I'm a big fan of. I've been reading her stuff for a long time. I even have uh, Carrie, I've got Ultimate Makeover here. Which wow. I, uh, yeah, I was going to my shelf. The old stuff. Old yeah, stuff. yeah, to grab the Auntie Mary Exposed. And I saw Ultimate Makeover up there. Mm-hmm. So we're going to, you're kind of short bio, you're a, you're a fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center that was that was newly announced, mm-hmm. which um, our friend Ryan Anderson, the great Ryan Anderson now, now mm-hmm. runs. You have your PhD from Catholic University, Catholic University of America. You are author or editor of a bunch of books. I don't know. Do, do you do you count them? Do you have any idea? It's probably close to ten, right? Uh, I've done eight, uh, but three of them have I've co-authored. So I did one with George Weigel on uh, John Paul II's Krakow, and then um, I've co-authored the Theology of Home series with Noel Mary. Okay, what, what's the George Weigel book? Which one is that? Uh, City of Saints is what it's called. Uh, oh, okay. okay. to crack out. So yeah, that was actually my first book. So we, we did that together. And when did that come out? You know, it was when World Youth Day was right before it. Um, so it must have been like 2016 or something. I can't I can't remember. Maybe 17. Okay. I'm not sure. All right. All right. Very good. Well, the way we're going to do this. So instead of just giving a bio that I read to start this, we kind of go through your bio. So we'll talk a little bit about you know where you're from, what you do. We're already hitting those things. Then the the books that you've done and Anti Mary Exposed, also your latest book. And I want to hit. We'll conclude by talking about what what your next project is, if you're if you're comfortable with that. But probably next to last, and I want to hit this kind of hard. And this is the reason that we set up this interview. Well, other than that, I I wanted to talk to you anyway and talk about your books. But but the whole big tech censorship issue, oh, right. and and what, <laughs> what happened with with Auntie Barry exposed and Facebook and Instagram. So we'll we'll hit we'll hit that on the way as well. So okay. just to start off, let tell us a little bit about whatever you're comfortable talking about, where you're from how you got to where you are, um, and a you, little bit about your education, your background. Go ahead, go for it. Um, well, first of all, I just want to say thanks for having me on the show. It's really a pleasure to meet you in this uh, format. I've obviously known of you as well for a long time be- um, with your book. So anyway, it's a, it's a real treat to, to have this um, time with you. Um, but yeah, I um, I finished my my doctorate and when uh, after I, my third child was born. And at that point, I realized, you know, I just wrote a dissertation, 300,000 words in five languages. I, I think I could write regular books. And so um, that's when I, I really started writing books. And um, the the first one was the the Pilgrim's Guide to um, Krakow that I did with George Weigel called City City of Saints. Um, and then we just kept moving. I just kept moving. You know, it seems like you probably have this experience where one book kind of leads to the, the next book that sort of, oh, yeah. um, you know, little stones and, and hints get left along the way. But, um, uh, and then I wrote this other book called uh, Nudging Conversions, which was actually a really fun book to write because it was about br- helping to bring you know, all the lessons I learned about bringing my family members back to the church. Um, and I think in, in many respects, I'm still developing that because I've, I've taken those ideas and used them in my family. Um, I keep talking about this book and um, the ideas and I keep expanding, expanding on it. So maybe there'll be a, a, an updated version down the road. But um, but from that, I, you know, I've had this interest in, in women's issues. In fact, it's funny because I hated I didn't want to do women's philosophy at all. I like I just didn't I would, had no interest in it when I was a graduate student. Um, and swore it off. I was like, I'm not going to be one of those women that goes into women's issues. And, you know, part of that I realize now is because some of it is just, it's not fun. It's not, doesn't translate well. It doesn't, it's hard for people to read. You have to have a whole language, um, you know, a a set of jargon that you already understand when you're going to read it in the first place. And so I just, um, I didn't want to do that. And so anyway, I've kind of gone through the back door in terms of getting into women's issues, but of course it's been an issue for me because, I have so many friends that I, I know were raised Catholic, but they just don't get the church. They don't feel, um, you know, and the feel is the right word. We, I think we're dealing with an age of emotion right now and not of logic. And that was, you know, a hard lesson for me to learn as a philosopher, you know, that you can't reason your way, it, most most people into the, the church, that it's a lot of times it does, it's these other extraneous things that bring them in. Um, so anyway, that's kind of where I just started launching into dealing with women. Um, with the, the, first, with Ultimate Makeover, the experiences I learned about motherhood and how 
you know, motherhood is actually supposed to be hard. Um, and as soon as I figured that out, then it, it, it almost became easy um, because it's, I think we, we try and pretend that it's not hard and that makes it even harder because we're figuring, we constantly feel challenged. And yet those challenges are precisely the things that we as women need to bring out the, the virtues in us. Um, so anyway, from there, the anti-Mary, the Marian option, those books came about and um, finally led to, to the Theology of Home projects that I'm working on, both the books and the website. Well, and so in between those books, so you, first of all, your, your dissertation, 300,000 words. I yeah. mean, the, the folks at TAN, the editors at TAN, you know, they, they know what that means, right? I mean, 300,000 yeah. word yeah. book. Yeah. yeah, that is, I mean, I would guess the Auntie Mary Exposed is probably what, about 70,000? It's between 50 and 60. Mm -hmm. Okay, so picture 50 to 60, picture five or six of those, right? <laughs> and that, yeah, then, then you get you get to 300,000. I mean, 300,000, I think, I did a book that was 300,000 words, and I think it came out to about 700 pages. So that's, yeah. so that, that's long. What, what was, what was your dissertation on? Um, you know, it was on Alistair McIntyre and Jacques Maritain on human rights. Um, so oh, wow. it was a fascinating topic because it got into so much history and um, just the history of human rights, you know, all of these elements that I think we are, are very current today. In fact, I just published a piece at, um, Catholic World Report that was kind of an extraction from it, but um, otherwise I haven't really done very much with it, but it was really just a great survey, survey piece. And um, I'm told that it has, it's been cited significantly, especially because it's a, it has never been published. Um, so it's been heartening to me that people are actually using it and finding ways to buttress their own research. Um, you haven't sought to publish it. Yeah, you know, I haven't. I I got kind of tired of it, and you know, I had more kids, and um, I just had other stuff to do, and um, so no, I, I I haven't done anything with it yet. Well, I'll ask you what people ask me and my wife: How many kids do you have? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just had my fifth last February, so yeah, a little caboose baby, and uh, anyway, so we and we homeschool, so I, I'm I'm busy homeschooling the other four, and then obviously taking care of the baby. Well, we do too. We do too. We homeschool as well. So the, now you mentioned nudging conversions. Mm -hmm. Are are you, uh, so let me back up a little bit. You went to Franciscan University in Steubenville for, for yep. your master's degree. Mm -hmm. And I think as an undergrad, did you say University of Oregon? I, I finished at the University of Oregon. So kind of while I was at the University of Oregon, I had this kind of a big conversion. I was always a cradle Catholic, but very poorly catechized. And um, when I was in college, I had, there was this real tension, I think, going on um, where it was just this tug of war, really, between, on the one hand, I had a grandmother who was very involved in the New Age, and I was very devoted to her, and so I was probably exposed to a lot of things I ought not to have been exposed to by her. Um, and then I had, um, you know, obviously the hookup culture and all of this that's happened at, on college campuses. Um, that tug as well. And then um, there was the church and my, my father had passed away when I was a teenager. And so I think that after that point, you know, I, I didn't have anybody to rebel against. I, you know, my mom was grieving and she took over his business and she was busy. And, uh, you know, it was just, I was very independent at that point. And I, it was one of those things where I realized, you know, I didn't need to, I, I needed to answer my own questions and search, find my own way. And um, that's really where the faith came in. I knew it was, there was it was right. It was true. Um, but again, it just took so long to get catechized. This was before the internet, so you couldn't just look things up and you were dependent upon Catholic bookstores. And a lot of times the stuff they were selling was just awful. And so anyway, it was a, a real challenge, I think, to find the faith. And yet, um, you know, thanks be to God, I was finally ultimately led in the, in the right direction with some help of some, some great priests who did point me in the right direction and some great women that helped me learn about Marian consecration and, and all of these things. So that was a, a real um, turning point in my life for sure. Did, did that happen at that point while you were at the University of Oregon or? Yeah, it was all it was all definitely going on. I um, I would pray with these women every Thursday morning, um, the rosary at the, actually my high school, the chapel at my high school, they were all moms of my friends um, that I had gone to high school with. And so they, I'm sort of the mascot. They were gracious and let me join them and, um, and so it was, it was really their influence and, and an adoration chapel that I had access to, these kinds of things that were just in my life in such a way that I could see truth and reject these other things that were so, um, you know, pressing upon me, I think, in other ways. So, and so, then from there, I went to Steubenville, um, which was, you can imagine going from the University of Oregon to Franciscan University, you know, what a culture shock that was, but right, right. what a good one. 
Yeah, no, I, I can relate to this very much. I mean, this, this is a very similar story for me. I was at the University of Pittsburgh. Oh, and wow. um, yeah, I, you know, I think football, when I think of both of these, were, were you at Oregon? They had a really good football team, I believe. They did, right, yeah. under Chip yeah. Kelly, and not when I was there, but um, yeah, Chip Kelly was there for a long time. And they had a quarterback who was a star. Was Mario, Joe... uh, Mar uh, Mario. Oh, right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah. Last um, name? Yeah, Mariota, right? The yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. And Joey Harrington was there too. Joey Harrington was there around yeah. that time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's a great one. So, My mom is an avid Duck fan, so yeah, she's probably, <laughs> she ever saw this, she'd be horrified that I didn't remember these names better. But anyway, right, yeah. right, right. But but so you're a, a lot like me then. I mean, I so I'm technically, I guess I'm technically a revert, but I tell people usually that I'm a convert mm -hmm. because I feel like I never really had the faith. Right. Yeah. No, that's exactly right. I think revert. I, I think we need to come up with a new word for it, Paul. Maybe we can come up with something before right, the right. conversation. So that well, in my case, I, I went to, yeah, I went to sort of evangelical Christianity, was even a Presbyterian for a time. So for a time, I was Protestant. That probably went on. So college, I was agnostic, kind of atheist, left that way. And then in graduate school, became a Christian largely through evangelicals and then came back to the Catholic Church. It would have been 2000, uh, 2005. Mm -hmm. And I graduated undergrad in 1990. So there's a long period there. With you, it sounds like, I don't think you were ever, you were ever Protestant, right? No, I never, never went to Protestant life. route. I mean, if anything, I was probably closer to New Age than Protestant. But um, wow. yeah, no, I never, never left entirely. Did you have, did you have Catholic schools growing up? Were you in Catholic school? Because you mentioned I, the chapel. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I went to, I mean, this is the saddest part is that I, you know, went to Catholic schools almost all of my um, grade school, certainly all of my high school years. And, um, it, you know, it was just very watered down or um, kind of made to be paltry. In fact, I tell my children one of, you know, one of my favorite memories um, is going on, spending some time in the chapel and the, the teacher leading us in a meditation where we had to imagine that we were rocks in a, a brook. Um, yeah, and this was considered, you know, religion education. So, right. yeah, I had a lot of catching up to do. Um, it was spirituality. Like, well, exactly. So, so you're in there thinking about Jesus and the Eucharist, and you're being exhorted to think about yourself as a rock. As a rock. Right? Think about rocks. Fire not, not gently flowing over you. And yeah, no, it was bad. <laughs> it sounds like kind of, have you have you been on any of those shows, Marcus Grodi or anything like that? Uh, no, I haven't. Yeah, no, I it, haven't. It's been kind of, I, I feel I, I've been asked to do a few of these in the past, and I feel I often decline. I usually decline. I think I've always declined. Because I'm afraid that that sharing some of this stuff would be embarrassing to certain people. Yeah, that's the hard part. Is 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 definitely that that element. And you know, you obviously, you know, there's so many friends and people that I have in my life and in the past that I I still think a great deal of. And so it is hard to share these things. And yet they this really wasn't a huge obstacle to my faith was this this really important um, catechesis and training. So. So then, so then you go to Franciscan, mm -hmm. Franciscan University of Steubenville. Is that right out of undergrad or? Um, you know, I spent about a year, I spent some time in France and then I just kind of needed to figure out what to do. I, I, um, I had this desire to do a master's degree in philosophy, but it was like out of nowhere, you know, I don't, and I'm sure, you know, I know it was the Holy Spirit just needing to sort of put me in a, a, a Catholic environment and train me with people my own age. And, you know, all of that had to happen, but, um, yeah, but it was just so random. Like what, you, you just did a degree in history from the University of Oregon and now you want to move to Ohio to this place nobody's heard of, you know. So it right. took a while, I think, to really wade through that and see that all the doors were closing on my other options. And this was the one that just kept opening. And so that's that's when I ended up there. Um, and even my PhD, you know, when I finished my master's degree, I was like, oh, I'm done with academics. I'm never going back. Uh -huh. uh, you know, and then the next thing you know, I'm doing a, a, a doctorate at, at Catholic U and, and just kept doing it. But by and large, you know, much of it was motivated by the fact that I knew I had had such a bad education that I wanted to be able to educate others and certainly my children with all of these pieces that I just hadn't had. Um, so it was a great way to catch up and then, you know, just keep going um, with the degree. Did you have a particular mentor or, or somebody at Franciscan I, by, by the way, you you went through the same program that my son is in now. That's so great. And, yeah. Yeah. yeah it's a great program. Loves it. Absolutely loves it. Yeah. Anybody in particular stand out there? 
You know, the one person I think that was probably the most formative, even though I didn't spend that much time with him, was my spiritual director, Father Dan Petit. Um, who, he's not there now. He's, um, I think he's in Texas right now. But um, anyway, he, I know one, one of my first times to, to go to confession and visit with him, um, he said, you know, you need to spend an hour in adoration every day. And, um, you know, I just sort of laughed. I was like, are you kidding? Like, I don't have an hour. Just, what are you talking about? <laughs> to pretend you're a rock. Yeah. Well, exactly. <laughs> um, so anyway, he, um, he said, no, I think you can find the time. And, um, and I did find the time and it was absolutely transforming. I think it was wow. that time every day, every day. Um, yeah, I was, probably, yeah. Which is, which we went from one parent to another with a bunch of kids is mm-hmm. easier to do when you're single. Oh man. Isn't that the <laughs> truth? Yeah, no, that's exactly. And, and that was kind of what I was mindful of too, was this was going on was just the realization that I didn't have kids. You know, I did have full time class. I was actually working full time at, at, as well. I was going to mass, I was praying the rosary. And I was like, really, I have to add this hour every day. And, but I lived close enough to campus that, um, it just became manageable. And it was really a, a habit I had up until I got, until I had children actually. Um, and it was great. And I think that that was really transforming because I was, I learned how to pray. Um, you know, I learned little things like you're a lot warmer in a church if you're on your knees than if you're sitting down. And, you know, mm. I learned that my knees got tougher. I could kneel longer. And, you know, all of these things that when you've got an hour to fill, you sort of figure out how to pray better. Um, and uh, rather than just going in with a book and kind of keeping yourself entertained. So anyway, that I, I think that was really the best piece of advice I ever got my entire life. And, um, I, you know, I look forward to the day eventually when I can get back to it. Um, so but that's yeah, the, the, the beautiful you. little chapel, right? At Franciscan, yeah, that's the, the I think, yep. right? Yep. Named for exactly. uh, St. Francis, where Francis was. It is. And you know, when you're in a place like that, it's just so much easier to pray because it's beautiful and it's sort of dripping with history in terms of the representation of what it was in, in Italy to St. Francis. And um, yeah, it was just a really amazing place of prayer. In fact, I actually talked to uh, Father Scanlon at one point, um, God rest his soul, at a wedding. I said, I want those plans. And he said, I'll get you those plans. And anyway, I never got the plans. So the, the, pl- the plans for the, for the, the chapel? For the chapel. Yeah, I was at some point, I want to build another one. Wow, nice. Oh, yeah, great idea. Wouldn't that be great? I mean, every, yeah, every Catholic. Backyard? I know. Yeah. 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 <laughs> So, so you went, so after that, so you, you finished your dissertation there and your dissertation in 2013, your PhD 2013, is that what you said? Yeah, my, well, then I went to Catholic U and yeah, finished that. I was kind of a circuitous route because at one point I left and I went to University of Virginia and then I, I stopped altogether and, um, and then I moved to Italy and I worked as a journalist for Zenit News over in Rome for a couple of years wow. where I met my husband. Um, and then, um, but yeah, I finally just was ABD and had to get that knocked out. So got that finished. Yeah. yeah. So you worked for Zenith. I did. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Is your husband Italian? No, he's American. He was actually teaching at the university of Dallas at their Rome campus when, when we met. Um, but he had been a monk um, before, long before we had met, he was with the, the Benedictines there at Norcha, um, helped found them and um, wow. Wow. left after four years. And then we met and, um, yeah, so now we're back. Uh, you know, this is this is interesting. So he was with the Benedictines in Norcia, mm-hmm. which of course is the inspiration for Rod Dreher's the Benedict option. Right, right. right. And and, right. and you coined the term the Marian option. I know there was some irony that, and I published it with Tan, and I was actually hoping they would put it under the Saint Benedict imprint, but they put it under Tan. But right, uh, they of course are Saint Benedict Press too. So, but sure. yeah, there's lots of uh, I think um, similar parallels and similar paths. Well, so among those books, that that's one of the ones that I wanted to hit. So you're okay. You're you're kind of history here as, as an author. Then then okay, you did the dissertation, three hundred thousand words. You didn't publish that. So what was your first book then? Was it the Weigel, but the book with George Weigel? Was it Ultimate Makeover? You know, it was uh, first the Weigel book, and um, we did we did that one together. It was actually something I wanted to write before, right after John Paul II died, and um, and then I thought, you know that ship has sailed, like people aren't interested in Krakow right now. And it was only then when I found out that World Youth Day was going to be in Krakow that I thought I should do this again. So I asked George about it. And then that's when we decided to, to write it together. Um, so when did that come out? Uh, 2014, maybe? No, it must have been 2015. Um, okay. All right. And then yeah, yeah. while I was doing that, I had this idea for, for nudging conversions um, because just from my own experience, it was super easy to write and just really 
a fun book, um, you know, going into ways that you can help bring your loved ones back to the church, but without using apologetics necessarily, find different mm-hmm. ways and approaches and things, ways to talk to people, um, to basically love them back into the church, um, you know, in, in a way that works instead of feeling like you're beating your head against the wall, which I spent a lot of time doing that. So it was very much a book about, um, you know, trial and error for me and what worked and, and what, what didn't. Um, that was Pope the, all the six said what that, that people will op- more often listen to witnesses, right. Then I forget the, I forget the quote. Mm-hmm. That, um, than than um, than apologists and teachers, but first yeah. you need to be a witness. I'm I'm goofing up the quote. It's a nice right. quote. You just destroyed it. But 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 in a, in a way, that's that's what you're doing there, right? You're sort of modeling the faith more than preaching. Right. Yeah. No. And that was absolutely the the core of it. You know, when I finally started realizing that my relationships were getting more tenuous because I was trying to catechize my family and teach them and bring them back to the church. Oh, interesting. Um, that's actually when I when I realized I just needed to stop altogether because this wasn't showing good fruit, um, and that 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 was actually what was really transforming because then I and I just thought I'm going to be a better daughter, I'm going to be a better sister, I'm going to be a better friend, and that's going to be my focus. You know, I just thought God was like, you're just not made to evangelize, just stop it. Um, but instead, He was actually teaching me kind of through the back door what to do, and that I think that's really the key is. Um, is to be a better friend, a better daughter, a better father, a better sister, you know, any, all of those relationships and dive into that. And then when people are ready, that's when they know that they can trust you. They know that they've right. witnessed your life. They've witnessed your love, you know, all of that. So then it gets easy um, once all those pieces are already in place. Sure. Sure. So, okay. So you did um, then your, your first major book then would have been what, so nudging conversions that wasn't through TAM. No, um, Nudging Conversions and Ultimate Makeover were both done with Dynamic Catholic um, with Matthew Kelly. Matthew, I had actually worked for Matthew years and years ago when I actually when I was in Steubenville. Um, and so I, another publisher was actually going to take Nudging Conversions um, and they just kept sitting on the contract. And finally, I sent Ultimate Makeover to Matthew, but I, I just it was just an outline. So I sent him the, the whole manuscript of Nudging and um, just said, you know, this is this is taken by somebody else, but I'm. Um, I just want you to get a sense of what my writing looks like. Um, and then, you know, by the end of like, two hours later, he wrote back to me and said, I'll take both of them if I can have right. them. And so I got in touch with the publisher and they were like, ah, oh, we've got plenty of books like this. So um, I ended up publishing with him um, at that stage. And, and so you, you're worried at that point about, or at least you had been at one point, about writing books that seem too much about women, right? Um, yeah, yeah. But, but, but you just kind of, I mean, this is the way it is, right? You end up doing some books like that and some not like that. Yeah. And, right? I mean, it's just kind of the way it, it naturally develops. It seems that it's exactly. been that way for you. Yeah, no, exactly. And most of my, especially uh, I've written a lot of articles in the meantime, too, and very few of them are about that. But yeah, I've definitely ventured, I think because I finally figured out what works with women. Um, so it just got a lot easier. But um, what is that? You know, I, I, it's it's very obvious, very simple. It's magazines, it's visuals, it's being providing things to women that, that they can identify with, they can see themselves in. Um, so this is what we've done with Theology of Home, both one and two. Um, they're highly illustrated, but we're really using them to, sh- to convey our own ideas, to convey the ideas of the church, um, to convey the ideas that are really the desire of every woman's heart. But what we've seen, you know, the way that we've seen this work the best, of course, is, is and I, I saw this so much with the anti-Mary research, um, is, you know, magazines and uh, soap operas, Oprah, you know, the fashion world, all of these um, outlets teen, are... Teen Vogue, right? Teen Vogue. Teen Vogue, exactly. You know, all I've emailed about that. It's, yeah. it's astonishing where Teen Vogue yeah. is. I mean, it's, it's, it's just jaw-dropping. It's, it's a, Yeah. No, it's, it's awful. So yeah, and all of these are just a, a passageway to, uh, you know, spread both the occult, Marxism, um, all the, the the worst parts of the sec- sexual revolution. Um, all of that is just being, you know, sprayed, scattershot through the through the culture. But it's done in such a way that it feels like you can trust these people. You know, look at someone like Gwyneth Paltrow and her Goop um, program. I mean, it's 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 this is someone that people are think that she could be their best friend. Um, so there's a sense of engagement and people feeling um, kind of an association and a trust um, with with these women. And this is why they've been so successful. And I think as Catholics, 
we've kind of done the opposite. We have all these amazing ideas, but we haven't, we've been very top heavy. We haven't found a way to, to get them down to the, the people in the pew. Um, and so it's, it's, that's been a real problem, I think. And this is, so this is why, you know, we've kind of shifted gears a little bit with theology of home. Um, because I think w- once you are in sort of a community and you find a place that's going to give you, feed you ideas that you appreciate, then it just gets easier to form a person, but also animate them and help them want to go out into the world and do more. And so it's been really amazing just even in our community of people that we know have read the books, the books, actually the first ones, and I think the fourth printing. Um, oh, really? Wow. Wow. Yeah. yeah. There's a theology of the home, uh, one and two. Right. And mm-hmm. so when, when did, when did two just came out? Two just right. came out in September. Exactly. Um, okay. So one um, came out in the September of 2019, and then two came out in 2020. Um, and then we started this website, this aggregate site, before actually even both books came out. Um, and we just aggregate content from secular as well as Catholic sites. And, you know, every day we have about eight articles that we present. And um, we've got... And what's the web, What's the website? It's theologyofhome.com. Okay. Um, All one and, word, theologyofthehome.com. Yeah, just theology of home, not no the um, theology of home. Exactly. Um, and the co-author is is Noel Maring. Noel Maring, exactly. So and, and um, what, uh, tell us a little bit about how you connected with her. So Noel and I actually went to Steubenville together. We were um, we were called the Philosophy Girls. There were there was uh-huh. Noel and me and another young woman named Natalie. Um, the three of us were in that program together, and um, for one year. And so we were great friends because we just were together all the time. And um, Noelle and I were both from the West Coast, so we were both sort of had similar backgrounds. And um, Which I could tell you, Steubenville is very different from. <laughs> <laughs> right? It I mean, is. So I, I, I spent a lot of time in California. In fact, we we're going to be there, I think, for two or three weeks again in nice. August. Uh-huh. And um, yeah, I I like Steubenville. It, it's very, 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 very different from the so West Coast. Different. I'm actually from Western PA, so. I, mm-hmm. I like going to Steubenville, which is in what it's what they call the panhandle. Mm-hmm. It's between it's between West Virginia, Ohio and Pennsylvania. You can literally be in Pittsburgh in 45 minutes, which is closer than where I am in Grove City, which is Pennsylvania, which is north of Pittsburgh. And it's right across the river from West Virginia. And but it is really it's an old mill town. I mean, it's like right out of I don't know if people remember this movie from the 70s, The Deer Hunter. Oh, right? Right. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It, it still yep. has that feel, yep. has that smell. I yep. don't, I don't mean that. that necessarily in a bad way, right? In a way, it's kind of a throwback, kind of neat. I mean, you could be, the last time I was there, I guess a few months ago, I'm I'm at a light and there's a guy in like an old 75 Buick with a dead deer across the front of it, <laughs> all right? You know, <laughs> roped across the front of it. Yeah. So yep. that is, uh, it's, it's, it's old school, very, very different. So Noel yep. is from the, the West Coast as well. She was. So we actually spent a lot of time in Pittsburgh. I love Pittsburgh. I spent. It's a great I, city. It's amazing. I, I had so much really. fun hunting down old bookstores and Heinz Chapel and, you know, amazing. I got married at Heinz Chapel. Did you really? Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. It's uh, such a beautiful May 22nd, 1993. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Uh, my wife programmed my, my, um, uh, my briefcase with I have it an old Ooh. briefcase, you know, oh five two two nine three. That right. Way. There's no way you can forget it. That's forget great. It. That's mm-hmm. great. Yeah. Um so anyway, yeah, we were both from the West Coast. So we we definitely had that, you know, culture shock uh there in Steubenville together. But um then she actually got married and went on to have six kids and I did not get married and I just kept traveling and moving and um, so somehow I think I was living in Italy. We must have connected through social media or something. And, um, that's when we started having a friendship again. But, um, it was only when I started theologyofhome.com, which was actually had a different name at that point, but, um, I asked her to, to write for me and she wrote me an article on, um, black turtlenecks, women wearing black turtlenecks. And, um, interesting. And so oh, from there, I got to tell my wife about this. Um, yeah. so yes, I love it. It's great. Um, so anyway, she just kept writing and writing and writing and she had no idea she could write. And um, so now she's actually, she has her own book coming out in May uh, with Tan called um, Awake, Not Woke. Um, and it's excellent. Oh, excellent, nice, excellent. Nice. Yeah. Um, we'll have to get you a review copy, but. Um, hey, wait, and, I love that. Awake, Not Woke. Yeah, it's wow. it's excellent. Oh, that's so um, cool. And she's so just good. a force, uh, just really very so sharp and so gifted. And um, anyway, we were actually just out there 
a uh, lot two weeks ago, um, doing photographs for our next book, Theology of Home Three, and um, visiting friends and doing some speak. I did some speaking out there, but um, anyway, so yeah, it's just been amazing to see you know how much this relationship that we fostered you know 20 years ago how much fruit it's bearing now because we already know each other. You know, we work from obviously I'm in Virginia, she's in California, so it's hard to work at a distance. But um, because I think we have this deep friendship, it just everything seems to to work really smoothly, and we complement each other very well. Sure. So, so the uh, a, a couple books that I that I really want to hit the I thought the Marian option was a great idea. So I mean, you you did write that as like a as like a follow up to the Benedict option, right? Or did you already have it in mind? No, no, not at all. Um, yeah, no, what happened was I was actually really intrigued by the Benedict option. And um, I, I gave a talk about it at Acton University. And um, while I was there, you know, I was researching and I thought, this is great, but Mary's done everything better. Right, <laughs> like, you right, know, right. Benedict was awesome. And, you know, I have so much respect for him. I used to live right around the corner from his cell, a little chapel in um, interest. And, and your husband was part of it. Was a part of them. Exactly. But, um, you know, if you're talking about evangelization, Mary did it better. If you're talking about dealing with Islam, Mary's done it better. If you're oh. talking about, you know, crumbling culture and building culture, Mary's done it better. Um, so it just seemed kind of a no brainer. And it was really interesting because it, Dreyer's book came out. Um, there were a couple others, one by Esalen maybe, and then another one probably by um, Shapu. And um, none of them mentioned Our Lady in, in any way. Um, right. So it was really interesting to see, uh, you know, to go back and look at this very big picture of who she is and the different ways in which she's been so instrumental throughout the culture. And, and really fun too, because of course I knew how, much um, what a role she played in philosophy, uh, especially for someone like Albert the Great, who, you know, rumor, rumor, the, the tale is that he had actually some kind of special infused knowledge from her and that was actually taken away at some point before his death, but it was restored for like 24 hours or something so that he could defend Thomas Aquinas. And then he went back to his, you know, state of, of um, mental incapacity. So oh, anyway, it was I just, I have not heard that. Yeah, no, it was just all these amazing stories and devotion to, you know, someone like Dun Scotus, um, tremendous devotion to Our Lady. And um, and then, of course, just European culture, you, you know, you spend enough time in Europe, you know, the just how much of it really is inspired by Our Lady. Everything from, you know, all the Notre Dames, um, you know, all the art, all the paintings, you know, all of these things are really a reflection of of her. And I think rather that, rather than Benedict, right? And yeah. Not Benedict, right, exactly. Right. I mean, there there are Mary statues everywhere. There aren't very many Benedict statues. There aren't that many. Yeah. And, you, and you mentioned Tony Esselin and Chaput. So mm -hmm. I think I think Tony's book was out of the ashes, right? Yeah, exactly. And Chaput, I remember the really um, snooty kind of snotty review in the Washington Post by Jamie Smith of Calvin College, mm -hmm. um, who we've had here at Grove City College. He's a good guy, but 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 it was it was just a it was just a really mean review. It was like a triple book review of Tony Tony Eslin's book, Chapu and Rod Dreher, all three of them together. Mm -hmm. And he but but so the Marion option came out at the same time, right? About the same Similar. time. Yeah, we got it out right before the hundred year anniversary of the um uh, Fatima, actually. So it was 2017. Okay. May, actually. So I think it was maybe because I had all of those books, maybe right before I turned my manuscript in. Um, but I didn't. Um, so it was, yeah, it was a few months later. So uh, you're averaging about a book a year at, the, <laughs> at, at, at this point. It's this kind yeah. of I mean, I, I know this well, it's kind of where you end up, right? In a way, you get all these ideas and people start coming to you with ideas and yeah. And yeah. in a way, you're you're kind of people think it's glamorous, right? Like, no, like, it's it, it, no, you're it, once it's exciting at first, and you've done a couple books, and then after a while, I mean, we wouldn't do it if we didn't enjoy it, right? Yeah. But but I mean, sometimes you're literally fighting off projects. Like I, yeah. I have five books that I'm working on right yeah. now, and and, yeah. and I and I have really one that should be a six that I ought to be doing, and I told somebody no, but it's it's mm -hmm. kind of there's so many good projects, so many different yeah. ideas. And right. Yeah. And when you're doing one a year, you almost feel like it's hard to dedicate promotion time to it because yeah. you're, you're, if a friend of ours like Al Cresta or somebody mm -hmm. wants to have you on the show, they have a hard time keeping up with whatever your latest book is. Right. right. Yep. But yep. but but you did you did the anti Mary Exposed next. Was it 2018, 2019? Yeah, 20, it came 
directly after it, um, actually, well, in between them, I did Mary and Consecration for Children, which is actually so much of right. the option. So that one was thrown in. Um, but yeah, then I did the anti-Mary um, Exposed because I had done a chapter in the Marian option about are we in the age of Mary or the anti-Mary? So I had already been thinking about it. And it was at that point that Tan said, you know, maybe you should do a bigger book on this. Um, so I spent probably the most amount of time on that book as I've spent on really any book. Um, the and, anti-Mary Exposed. Yeah, there's about two years of um, of research in that. And, um, you know, it's just painful research. You know so well how dark right. stuff is. And, um, and, you know, you get to a point, like I had to make the executive decision um, I just didn't want to put as much of that stuff in there. I use, I've kind of have little dollops of this awful stuff here and there, but I just didn't want it to be a book that people just felt like every page was agonizing because it's agonizing enough as it is um, right. to, to pull, you know, pull out all these examples um, was probably a wise thing to do. Um, and then of course the second half of the book is, is much brighter, I think, and yes. hopeful than the first dark half for sure. I, I was looking for my, if I could have found it quickly for my marginalia in here, where I have a couple comments on, you know, I have to stop reading this. <laughs> I mean, th this is, and, and you know, I, I did a book with Tan called The Devil and Karl Marx. I mean, it's right. kind of, you know. some point you have the stack of material mm -hmm. that's just, it's just, you know, it's awful. It, it, it's dark and, and you, yeah. you have to drop it and walk away. Mm -hmm. You don't want somebody in the middle of your book, right, to, you know, do a nosedive off the roof, right? Yeah, I mean, right. And, right. And, and some of it is, uh, you know, gross, right? I, I mean, gross in the yes. like, yeah. And there are things I, I literally could not put in the book because it was just so <laughs> illicit. I mean, it was awful. When, awful. From, from leading feminists, which tells you something yeah. about feminism, right? A lot. And, 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 the, and the material with um, Jezebel and some of the, some of the pagan and demonic, and yeah. you just kind of, you're crossing yourself as you, over as you read the and book. And over and over again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So when I say it's, it's a hard read, well, it's an easy read because it's well written, but, but it's, it's, it can be painful to get yeah. through. But, yeah, but, no, and I have had people tell me that, you know, I just had to put it down and walk away from it. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. And the, and the subtitle is Rescuing the Culture from Toxic Femininity, which brings me to, and I'm watching the clock, we gotta, we're, we keep this under an hour. Um, that brings me to the fact that this book was censored, right? Mm -hmm. By Facebook and Instagram both, yeah. correct? Uh, yeah, both of those, yeah, because they're the same platform. Um, and is it maybe the, is it, do you think perhaps what got it flagged was the phrase toxic femininity? Was oh, I'm almost sure that had something to do with it. So yeah, no, both those platforms um, stopped selling it on their marketplace. And then um, what happened is I just put a picture of it on, on social media and people just went and bought the book. I mean, it's, it's truly been the best thing for this book. It's just kind of <laughs> right. I knew it would be. Yeah, like, no, yeah. Right. 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 exactly. Now you need the New York yeah. Times to trash it. I mean, that'll go straight to the bestseller list. Exactly. So, um, so that happened, and then, but because everybody was buying it, it went up to two hundred and forty-two or something on Amazon's site. Wow, probably the highest uh, it ever got on Amazon. Well, it had, but then you know what happened was they actually took the buttons down so people couldn't purchase it. They ran out wow. of copies. Uh, wow. But you could still buy it from a third seller, but there were no buttons that said, you know, purchase now or will be delivered in March or whatever. Like you just couldn't buy it from them, literally, even though the publisher knew they had already put in a new order. Um, so they were, Tan was dealing with them trying to get them to, to fix it. And it would, they would put it back up for like an hour and then they would take it down again. Um, so. Wait, so that was not Amazon censoring it or anything it was well, just it wasn't like, censoring it but what was curious is it you know it was number one on fe feminist books i think what they were trying to do was make sure it didn't get to a bestseller list um i don't think they wanted it going into their top 100 list i think they saw that this was you know being was an explosive situation on an older book and it, it wasn't an authentic you know best-selling situation so i think okay. you know i i could be totally mistaken maybe it was just a fluke but the fact that you've got you know Facebook and Instagram both tinkering with it. Um, and there's something going on at Amazon. You know, this is a two-year-old book. It's not like this just right. came out. And um, so it, it was all very suspicious because it was the f Sunday and the week after the inauguration as well. So, you know, raises all kinds of 
I and so a, a time of you know, volatility people. and anger and right. a lot of people right. censoring people that they disagreed with. Exactly. And, and sort of I, an, I mean, acting with impunity, too, because now, you know, Biden's president and they're not worried about um, the cancel culture so much. So, yeah, so it's been great for the book. Um, it's been really interesting. To see, it was very interesting to see who reached out to me in terms of media. Um, you know, of course, um, Breitbart covered it, Daily Wire, you know, all kinds of Catholic media. But um, it was, I was, it, Russia Times featured me. I was on the front of Russia Times with a video series or a TV really? series, TV show. Um, I you was, never thought that would happen, right? Never, because, thought, you know, I know, never thought that would happen. Um, and then I did Polish uh, newspaper and then Hungarian radio. Um, so it was interesting that you have this Eastern Bloc that was really interested in it in terms of just getting, you know, right, right. Getting, um, you know yeah. people that really deal dealt with censorship much more than, you know, we certainly ever have. So all, all, all of my translations of my books have been mainly in the Eastern Bloc. Now, that's because they deal yeah. with John Paul II, Ronald Reagan, right. communism and so forth. But still, right. from right. a kind of cultural viewpoint and a religious viewpoint, I mean, it's it's the Eastern Bloc countries, Poland and so forth, that, that just seem more receptive to faith. Yeah, and, absolutely. And, 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 you know, kind of went through, the, you know, the crucible there mm -hmm. on on censorship. The um, so but Amazon, by and large, has been good to you. Right. You haven't. Have, had, yeah. Haven't no. Had and we haven't problems. since that week there there hasn't been any further problems. So, um, yeah, they, they they've been, you know, they haven't pulled a Ryan Anderson with me on terms of not selling it in certain ways. Right. So, right. Yeah, yeah, Ryan at the Ethics and Public Policy Center when Harry met Sally. Right. They yanked it. I, so you could buy Mein Kampf if you'd like right. to on Amazon, but you can't get Ryan Anderson, Dr. Ryan Anderson's book mm -hmm. on transgenderism. Right. No, nope, you can't get it. So, but I love the fact that you said it was the number one bestseller among books on feminism. Oh, it was amazing because yeah, the mm -hmm. book that was right underneath it was. Um, this book that's actually an, an almost naked black woman, but all of the the artwork around it is completely Our Lady of Guadalupe. I mean, it's just yeah. sick how uh, just the wow. amazing contrast between wow. these two books. Wow. I think at one point it was sandwiched between that book and another book called I Hate Men. And, um, you know, nice. anyway. nice. so yes. uh, those were the the kinds of things I got a lot of screenshots of because it was just, they were just priceless. Well, if you, you need to write next, um, exposing the culture of toxic masculinity, oh, and then well. probably they'd probably promote it. They would. They, they would, would, in fact, they would, yeah. They would love it. You, you said it was interesting who reached out to you. Did you get anybody, so despite the fact that the Russia Times and Eastern mm -hmm. Bloc, did you get anybody from the liberal left who was, who was sympathetic, who reached out? Probably not, right? No, uh, not at all. Um, and, you know, I don't think that's an, in any way an, an accident. I mean, that's basically, I mean, the book, The Anti-Mary, is their playbook. This is what they've done with women for 50 years. It's uh, the exact same talking points, the exact, you know, the patriarchy, like all this stuff is just so um, deep in terms of the way their way of thinking that it, it would actually really take someone a, a real conversion. And I have heard that that's happening. Um one woman I just heard of, she she was having, I think after the election, she was having some sort of political conversion. Then she read my book. And the next thing you know, she's praying the rosary. Like she'd never, she hadn't prayed it since her first communion. And so I'm hearing amazing stories, even, you know, lesbians who are leaving the lifestyle and, and uh, you know, almost to a one people that read it say, you know, something just clicked. I just got it. And um, so I think that there's something about it. You know, one, one of the earliest readers said, when you see the anti-Mary, you can't unsee it. Um, it's just everywhere. Oh, wow. And um, wow. so, yeah, I think to, to have some sympathies on the other side um, would be great. And but it would take a lot of intellectual honesty. And I don't think that's really what they're after at this point. I think it really is motivated by power and control. Isn't it amazing, though, how they, they don't reach out like, like you hear all the time that, that the other side wants dialogue. <laughs> but 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 I but I never get emails from any of them, or yeah. or right. I'll, I'll write an op-ed piece based on a book, and I'll write it right down the middle as much as I can, right, and send it to the Washington Post or the New York Times. But but if but if but if the overall point is a point that they don't want to make, right, yeah. they just and, and the editors will even be nice; they'll they'll respond to, but they'll they'll come up with a million reasons not to run it. Yeah. And, and they they are so close minded. It's it's really remarkable. And, and they preach diversity and tolerance, but but they don't do that at all. And you would think um, you mentioned Breitbart. I was reading the other day Bill Maher's latest comments on Breitbart. And, you know, Bill Maher can be vulgar and all. And he was in this moment, too. 
but he was really lighting up people on his side for the cancel culture. Mm -hmm. And 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 the things that he was saying was was spot on. But mm -hmm. other than occasionally guys like him and a few others, they just sort of swim along with their side. They yeah. never sting their own, right? They never condemn their own. They they just they just go after the other side. Mm -hmm. And they never reach out. You think it would be a nice moment of solidarity, right? From a Barry Weiss type. Well, she's somebody who's reached out to the other side, right? Mm -hmm. and, and would say, hey, you know, I'm on the other side politically, but what they've done to, to you is wrong here. No. But, but no. You, you, you just, you don't hear no. anything. Nothing like that. So, and, and I guess, you know, I, I certainly wasn't expecting it, but um, I think that's just the more, the tragedy of it is is the fact that it is such a, a tight um, ideology that people are just really trapped in and they've got their, there are different points that they think are right and anything that goes against that, you know, it really is a dogma of sorts. Um, you know, it's everything, even a couple of weeks ago, Madonna was blamed, you know, had a Twitter feed, something to the effect of kill the patriarchy. Um, apparently she's upset because they've stymied her career or something, you know, she's only worth oh, yeah. $850 million. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so it, it's she really just faced terrible, terrible discrimination there. Yeah. It's just, terrible discrimination. Yeah. yeah she's really she's been silenced. Really. <laughs> yes. yeah, the, 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 the Madonna, uh, one of the points you make in, in anti Mary exposed, I read this and I think I said to my wife, Al, I said, Hey, yo, listen to this. Right. You, um, you talk about how she's taken the name Madonna, right? When right. everybody thinks of Madonna, they right. don't think of the Blessed Mother. They think of, what's her real name? Louisa, Louisa you know, it's, it's a very oh, Italian it's name. I, I could have told you 10 years ago, but. Right, yeah. right. So they think of her. And then you pointed out, I had I didn't know this, but one of the, um, a, a black singer that was now referred to as the Black Madonna mm -hmm. of all things, right? Yeah. At least in yeah. some some corners. Yeah. So our lady of Chester. The appropriation of that title. Yeah. Of, of all things. That's where the culture is. Where Madonna isn't the blessed mother, but everybody thinks of, of Louise of Ciccone. Madonna from the it. Like a Virgin tour, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, just incredible. Very subtle. Um, just efforts to sort of chip away at the culture and really take, take everything. Um, even, you know, down to pink hats, those awful right. pink hats, you know, well, who wears a pink hat? A, a little baby wears a pink hat so that, you oh. know, the girl, you yeah. know, just everything is stolen in very, very subtle ways, but it's, it's all distorted and, and gruesome, you know, just the corruption of innocence too. So yeah, right. it's really sad. Right. The, uh, one more thing on the censorship thing. So I, I wrote a piece on this called the devil on Facebook for crisis magazine. Right. Steve, it's great. You could put up a link to it mm -hmm. or something, but they also have censored their Facebook did among the tan books, a, a book for uh, for children right. on the stations of the cross. Right. And, and, right. and that one, when Sarah Maldonado of tan books reached out to me. And so I had known about your book first, your, yours kind of got it first. And then there was maybe another. And then I think my book, the devil and Karl Marx. And then, and then I said, any others? And she said, Oh yeah. Stations of the cross for children. Yeah. And, and, and the actual quote on this, the actual um, I've got the screenshot right here. No, oh, it's not there. Where is it? Um, yeah. Let's see. This is beautiful. I've got to read this. It says ad can't run. Ads must not contain shocking, sensational, inflammatory, or excessively violent content. Read our sensational content policy. And then underneath that, it has a picture of the cover of the book, Stations of the Cross. And the tan ad says, this fully illustrated version of the traditional Stations of the Cross contains new meditations by children's author, and it lists the name of the children's author. And that's it. And, and for people who think that well, maybe maybe the cover is really you know really gruesome, right? Maybe Jesus is maybe it's like a shot from Mel Gibson's movie, right? No, it's it's a cartoon, and and the corpus Jesus he's not even bleeding. Yeah. What, what what could be so inflammatory mm -hmm. and sensational about a book, a children's book on the Stations of the Cross? Which makes me wonder. So you know you could see. You know, maybe they're targeting your book because of the word femininity, right? Um, my book, I don't know, because of Marx, I, I don't know. But a book on the a children's book on the Stations of the Cross, of all right. things, that's got to make you wonder if, in that case, they're going after Tan, if yeah. they're going after Tan books generally, mm -hmm. if they're going to start going after Christian publishing houses, you know, Catholic publishing houses, and maybe they're coming up with excuses 
um, to, to, to just go at the publisher generally. Yeah, no, and it could very well be. And uh, I think that that's really, you know, it's one thing for my book to get banned, so to speak, but I'm still selling a ton of it. Um, but yeah, if we get locked out entirely, you know, if the, these things tan can't sell on Amazon that, you know, that's, it's going to force a lot of, of redirection and advertising and all those kinds of things. So in the end, it may not be the worst thing, but it's a tragic thing to think about, you know, we would get to that point that that could happen. It's important too. I, I've talked to the TAN books guys about this, Zach Flanick and others who's wonderful. Right. And the, you know, so to an extent, well, you've got the backup. You can go to TAN books website and you can order it there, but most people go to Amazon and, yeah. and, and also too, the beauty of Amazon is if, if you go there and if you order Carrie one of your books, like the Auntie Mary Exposed, underneath it'll list other books by Carrie Grass, right? But, you know, many of which are TAM. Oh, right. And, and, and in fact, somebody might buy Ryan Anderson's book on whatever, and underneath it'll say, you might also like, and then it'll have some of your books listed down there. Right. And right. all of which redounds back to TAN and helps sells books for TAN. Mm -hmm. so, so it's a good thing to really fight to keep Amazon open. It, 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 I mean, it's great if people go both places to order books, mm -hmm. but but it's, but it's we, we don't ever want this to, to happen to Amazon right. where it starts yeah. censoring our books. That's not a good thing. Yeah, no, it's not a good thing at all, so. Well, we got to wrap up. How much time do we have left here? Not much, a couple minutes. Can you just tell us uh, if it's okay, if it's not confidential or whatever, what, what you're working on next, what, what projects? <laughs> well, I'm not working on five books like you. Um, I could be, but unfortunately I just, I've had to really step away from writing. My family just needs so much of my time um, with homeschooling and everything. But um, we are working on a, a follow-up to Theology of Home. It's actually going to be a kind of a different format. Um, and it's going to be on the theme of um, at the sea is the, the topic. Um, so it'll be kind of a meditation on, uh, you know, beach life and all of that, um, as well as much deeper thoughts on, on the ocean and water and whatnot. Um, and then, I, you know, I've just, I've been working a lot on our website, um, theologyofhome.com. We really want to add a lot of original, start adding original content to it. Um, and then we have a store with it that has been really fun to develop because it's all Catholic lifestyle products um, that I think are, are having, uh, doing a great job of evangelizing really in their own right. We have these candles that look like soy candles that you can buy at any gift shop, women's gift shop. And yet, um, if you get them blessed, you can give them to a friend and they will, you know, serve as sacramentals in their home. So um, we're really working on building in that, that aspect too, because I think that Catholics haven't done a good job in, in this area generally. Um, you know, we have a lot of products, but we don't have things that sort of fill this gap of lifestyle products, like someone like a Magnolia home or um, you know, even something like, um, Martha Stewart or whatnot. So this is a real area that I, I think is, is just a gap. And, um, so we've been working on that cause it's just, it's been really fun. And I think it's nice to be able to have products that people get excited about and can give to just about anyone and still know that they're going to be effective in, in fighting the culture. And can you get that at theologyofhome.com? All theologyofhome.com, exactly. Good, good. So if people want to follow you, they can follow you there? Is that the main spot? Yeah, that's the best place. Um, Instagram is probably the, the place on social media that I keep up the best. Assuming you're not shut down on Instagram. I know, exactly. So, and we do, we have, ha, do have a, a subscribers um, option at Theology of Home because, and, and in light of that, in fact, I had a very wise man tell me before we started, you know, set up subscriptions because you could get locked out and that's the only way you're going to be able to communicate with people. With right. your readers. So we have that option. And of course there's little bonuses that come with subscribing as well. So um, yeah, that's very uh, wise indeed. definitely something we, we've been developing. So follow you there. Go to Amazon. Check out your books there. Go to Tan Books. Check out, check out, check out your books there. Yep. Yep. And, and, and if people want books autographed or signed, to, especially to a, a friend or mother or somebody, um, they can order them from us too at, at theologyofhome.com. Well, that's great. That's good. That's good. Yeah. Well, great. Well, thank you very much. You're thank doing you. amazing work. You're really oh, doing goodness. the Lord's work, and oh, you know, fine. I knew this hour would fly, and you, you're an <laughs> easy interview. And, uh, and, and easy to read too. Well, I mean, agonizingly easy to read. Sometimes, right? <laughs> Just right. get through to the second half. That's all. Yeah, I'm yeah. That, but by the way, that is so true. You got to you got to work your way through the middle part of that book to to yeah. reach the light at at, at the end. Yeah, it's, it's, it's worth it. Through. 
but yeah. uh, but thanks for all you do and and you. um, our friend Mallory we should give a shout out to our friend absolutely Mallory. God bless Mallory Millet absolutely so yeah. so thanks a lot take care yeah you too thank you and uh, everybody thanks for joining us we'll we'll be back again next month with another episode of this podcast so until then we'll see you bye bye